it's great, with great honor that I announce our next speaker. Lieutenant General Thomas McInerney retired after 35 years of active duty service as a fighter pilot and commander at every level from squadron to major air command. He has been a Fox News military analyst for almost 15 years and he has, he has done numerous radio shows as a guest informing the nation on national security matters. And as we just heard from Claire, we need more of that. The general also served on a Citizens Commission on Benghazi. Help me give a warm Jacksonville welcome to Lieutenant General Thomas McInerney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryman. Glad you didn't do a 30-minute introduction. Um, look, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. In this whole great nation, there is no other group that is honoring those that lost their lives and those people that fought at Benghazi. Jacksonville is. Thank you, and you deserve great credit for it, and God bless you. Now, specifically, I want to thank Beth, I want to thank Ryman, and the 17 other members of the committee that set this up and worked so hard to make it happen in this beautiful building. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Now, this attack ranks as one of the most unexplained attacks in U.S. diplomatic history for some of the following reasons. First, no force protection was provided when there was ample intelligence of an attack, and on 9-11th anniversary, it made no sense. Why wasn't there force protection? Why were we not prepared? Two, no force protection or reinforcements were provided during the attack, although it went for longer than 13 hours. There was no attempt. And Charles explained why the commander of AFRICOM had forces, yet there was no attempt to rescue or reinforce those people at Benghazi. Number three, U.S. forces never played a role in the evacuation from Benghazi, which is unbelievable. Number four, this is the most covered up event in U.S. history to include Watergate. It is far greater than Watergate. And the American people do not understand that. You are helping to explain to America that that's what our problem is. Five, the corruptness sta starts in the Oval Office. It starts right in at the Oval Office. And Charles, I'll tell you who should have given that command. There's only one person, and that's the President of the United States made the decision not to reinforce and go after those people that were attacking at Benghazi. Only one person could do that. Make no... That's absolutely factual. He didn't do it. The corruptness starts, as I said, in the Oval Office. Two secretaries of state, two se three secretaries of defense, two CIA directors, two attorney generals, two chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all were involved with this in the cover-up and with the decisions that were made on not to reinforce and go and protect those people. That is far greater than Watergate, which was limited to the Oval Office. So you understand the magnitude. Someday, Charles, someone will expose this and America will know. But those of us that know the organization and know how decisions are made at the National Command Authority know exactly where that role lies. You heard Ty Wood's father, Charles, he's got his lovely daughter, Hope, here, tell his heart-wrenching story, as well as Claire Lopez's detailed account of what transpired. The reason that this event taught us tonight is so important is that you as concerned American citizens must fully understand the dangers this nation faces 
with this administration, the dangers that we face today with this administration. And a biased mainstream media, complicit, not only biased, but they are complicit. And they are complicit in the reelection of Hillary Clinton. They're not biased, they are complicit. They are complicit in the cover-up. They are complicit in not getting the focus that this nation needs to spend on this issue. Now, Claire and I, as members of the Citizens Commission on Benghazi, which was mentioned, have spent nearly four years investigating this to include meetings with congressmen, survivors, Charles Woods, his family, other members of the families there, countless bureaucrats asking what went wrong. Even today, think of it, four years later, we do not know where President Obama was through that whole time frame. Four years later, we do not know where he was. Yes, he met with Secretary Panetta and General Dempsey in late afternoon around 5 o'clock D.C. time but never did the president authorize a rescue attempt or reinforcements to be sent with cross-border authority. Only he could make that decision and nothing ever happened, so it means he did not make that decision. This is a shameful act that America and the world have left hidden and again, important why this event is so important to America's history. We cannot let it die. We cannot let it slumber. We can attribute the cover-up to the shameless leadership by this president in his bid for re-election and simply leave it there. But that it met his narrative that Osama bin Laden was dead GM was alive. Is that the only reason he let four people die and 10 wounded? Think of that. It had to be his decision that he couldn't break his narrative for his reelection. It's that simple. However, there are too many more important American leaders that played an important role in this and that they have not come forward to include the select committee chaired by Trey Gowdy, who I'm a great fan of, but whose useless report that just provided more ammunition to cover up the whole event in Hillary Clinton. We can expand in this into question and answer, but when you think about it, he's got an 800 page report that does not have conclusions, it does not have an executive summary, it does not have recommendations, it doesn't have anything. He wants the American people to read it. Well, about page three, you're going to fall asleep. He didn't do his job to tell America what this administration did. And the reason is, is because the Republican leadership was complicit in this cover-up. As you can see, I did not and am not leaving any bark on this tree. Hollywood's movie, 13 Hours, captures the reality better than anybody could ask. If you have not seen it, please do. Next to the death of Ambassador Stevens, Ty, Glenn, and Sean, the saddest moments that occurred is the Libyan Air Force C-130 rescue force, and that was the rescue force, a Libyan Air Force C-130, no American airplanes. That is disgraceful. As a boy, I remember well when Bataan fell at the start of World War II. Yes, I am that old, Mr. Mitchell, but uh, uh, the fact is I remember it. For the, most of those people fought to the death and for the survivors that made it through the Bataan death march, a very small number. But we didn't have the force structure or the forces to do that. America accepted that because of our unpreparedness. But in this case, 
we had more than ample forces. As Charles said, General Ham said they were spun up, they were ready to go, yet nothing happened. They should have been there before anything ever happened. 9-11, are you not prepared? Why was there not airborne alert? Why were there not forces uh, continuously overhead? A global hawk can stay 20, 32 hours airborne. That whole time frame, the global hawk should have been over Benghazi and Tripoli. And that it's only two hours from where it was flying out of Sigonella. It was too easy for us not to have forces there. So why did we not have forces there? Those involved in the command chain should be charged with dereliction of duty. It's that simple. We must hold them accountable in accordance with the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Yet look at what happens with Hillary Clinton, who committed espionage and a cover-up and obstruction of justice, nothing. Lock her up. Lock her up. Now it should start right at the top and start right with the president and with Hillary Clinton. As Charles said, and I will repeat what he said, we must remember that on November 8th. She has already demonstrated that she does not have the skills to be the commander-in-chief. The only thing of significant importance that did come out of Benghazi investigation is that it exposed Hillary Clinton's rogue server. It has further exposed that she committed espionage and, I said, obstruction of justice. Charges that have not yet been filed and need to be prosecuted. However, what is happening is it is further exposing the corruption of the White House, the president, because he knew the first email she sent to the White House, he knew that that was from a rogue server. And I know that because when I was a number three man in the Air Force, not only did I oversee Air Force One, but I over, uh, also oversaw the White House Communications Agency, WACA. And the first email that came in Waka saw that it was a rogue email. And it immediately had to report to the chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, who was in Chicago, covering up all the deaths there. And so the president had to know, and that means this president was complicit in the cover-up of that rogue server. And he let it go on, just like he's let it go on and having the FBI and Comey and all these other people cover up for her. And so that is showing a corruptness in our government that we have never had before. Benghazi is bringing this out. And that's a very important fact. Again, unless you're here, unless you understand it, the mainstream media is never going to report this. And that's a danger to this great republic. In summary, on this fourth anniversary, your dedication to continue to press for accountability from the grassroots of America is greatly appreciated. Let us not forget Ambassador Stevens, Ty Woods, Glenn Darty, Sean Smith, plus the other 10 Americans that were wounded. For Hillary Clinton to say last Wednesday night that no Americans were killed when she attacked Libya is a gross misstatement and a lie. We lost four brave and patriotic Americans as a result of her leadership and failure, her leadership failure and decision to topple Colonel Gaddafi. As we remember this fourth anniversary of Benghazi this afternoon, let us, not for, let us also remember tomorrow, 9-11, on the 15th anniversary, and renew our commitment to defeat radical Islam and its evil ideology, as Claire so well laid out. The last seven plus years under this administration has let radical Islam create a caliphate in Syria and Iraq, as well as destabilize Libya and Yemen, as well as providing with Iran 
$150 billion, an economic windfall to modernize her economy and develop a modern nuclear weapons capability. Ladies and gentlemen, that is aiding and abetting the enemy. And in one word, that is treason. Here this afternoon, we must renew our commitment to defeat this evil ideology. And I might point out to you, 85% of, and I call it an ideology and not a religion, 85% of Islam has nothing to do with religion. Yet they're treated and they're given tax-free rights, etc. 80% of the mosques in the United States are funded by Saudi Arabia. And so we must challenge this evil ideology and challenge the Muslims to fix the problem. They must fix the problem. Or it will be, as Claire pointed out with us, we are on a very dangerous course. We must renew our commitment to defeat it. And only our government can, and the government must be held accountable to do this. No leading from behind. Americans lead from out front. And we must let the world know that this evil ideology must be expunged. And we want to hear fatwas from Mecca and Medina that say people that kill the Western, Westerners are unholy warriors and will forever live in damnation. They must fix it. We as infidels can't go over and fix their problem. So every Muslim in the world must be held accountable. We cannot let them get off with this. Now, now, thank you very much. God bless you all. And I look forward to our question and answer period where we can get into deeper discussion on this with Charles and Claire. God bless you all.